We're not live with Edie Patterson. No, it's Are live. we live Yay. now? We've done this every episode. I love it. <laughs> it's just become a tradition on our on our show. I'm Destin Harrison with the Gig Solid Green Room Interviews. This is Edie Patterson, Hi. who so graciously joined us. Edie, how are you? Doing good. How you doing? Doing well. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do, how you got there, why you love it? Sure. Wow. Um, so I'm an actor and a writer, and... Um, this is still part of actor, but I'm an improviser too. I do a ton of improv. Um, and, uh, yeah, I grew up in Texas and started doing plays and stuff in school. Um, I guess we didn't have like full on plays until high school. Um, but in like seventh grade, we had a thing called class day that you could like do whatever you wanted as a, it basically was a talent show. And, uh, me and some girls I knew did um, like a parody of the dating game, that old show, the dating game, where we wrote all our stuff and three of us were guys and there was a girl who was going to like vote on her date. And uh, one was a football player, like a jock character. One, I feel like one was like a businessman, which is so weird. <laughs> Just generic white collar nine to fiver. Yes. And then I was the nerd and it was like full on like... The most stereotypical, like, glasses, pocket protector, like, <laughs> pants too high, like, full Revenge of the Nerds style, <laughs> yep. or, like, Ed Grimley style, you know? Um, but we all wrote our own stuff, and then when we did it, um, I noticed, like, all the stuff I said and did was getting huge laughs, and I was really, really shy, um, but I felt like, oh my god, if I just act like another person... This works. <laughs> and that was the first time I thought, um, oh, maybe I can do this for my job. Maybe this is a job. For whatever reason, not until like seventh grade did I realize, oh, that can be a job. Like you can do that for your living. I don't know why it didn't, that didn't click for me. I always wanted to do that. And I would like come home and do um, impressions of my teachers for my mom and dad or um, put on plays at my house or like constantly force <laughs> My sister and people I knew to um, film horror movies with me in a giant camera where I would like edit it as we went. Um, but yeah, not until then did I go, oh, right, maybe I could do this. Yeah. And then I went to school in Texas, college, and majored in um, theater and acting, like BFA in acting. And then, um, yeah, just started doing my best to do it. I lived in Austin for a minute and... Um, worked like a regular job while I was doing tons of improv and doing some independent movies and kind of figured out pretty quick that I needed to go somewhere else to do that as my job. Um, cause you can do some stuff there and way more now than when I was there, but you couldn't like do it for, for your whole, um, income, you know, for your whole like life. <laughs> and I realized like, Oh, oh if I want to be, um, if I want to do TV and stuff like that, I need to go somewhere else. Yeah. Did you did you have a survival job while you were yeah. doing all of that in Austin? What did you do? I worked at a place. I answered phones at a place called Pitney Bowes Management Services. And I liked some of the guys there a lot. Um, shout out Bobby Horton, Errol Emmert. Um, but it was awful. It was awful. I don't know. Can you curse on this podcast? I mean, we try not to, okay. but... It, 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 yeah, the, but the MPA insert is the not F gonna word here. Awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was um, just like pretty soul soul sucking, and I just always couldn't wait until I could go do whatever at night and go to my improv rehearsal or go do my show or um, it was it was one of those jobs where like me and another guy would. Some days go across the street to where you could get a coffee, like in the lobby of this hotel across the street. And we would, <laughs> this sounds insane to me now as I have a coffee, we would get a quadruple espresso shot. How did you the not die? <laughs> I don't know, but we just wanted to like feel different. <laughs> <laughs> so you were you're you're drowning your sorrows basically. Yes. In caffeine. So we thought like, you were come back across the street like ah <laughs> <laughs> Just in search for anything. Yes, yes. Anything that's not Yeah, I used to make these collages and like <laughs> just anything. And they wanted me to um they kept wanting me to learn more things to like 
be, you know, do more at the job. And I just would say, like, I'm, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> How did it's that to go their over? credit that they never fired me. Because I would literally go, like, no, 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 you know what? I think just answering the phones is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm doing all right, actually. That's a nice suggestion, but... but they would suggest, like, tra- you know, I don't know if this is even what they were saying, but, like, train in Excel, or I don't know what they were saying, but something like that. Nah. I, I don't think so. <laughs> Put a card the suggestion that, box the on my desk. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, like, <laughs> I used to have these... I'm just thinking of these crazy things from it. I used to have these shoes that looked like, um, they uh, they were really cool, but they almost looked like hobo shoes. Like, they were these just big brown lace-up shoes. They were just, like, hipster shoes, you know? But they, um, they were really beat up, but they were cool. And I remember at one point, the, they told me to not to wear those to work because they were too, like whatever, too funky or whatever. And I just kept wearing them. <laughs> like, I don't know what was just wrong with Just to silent me. screw you to the company. Yeah, just to kind of go, yeah, if, if you need someone to not wear these, you should probably not have me here. <laughs> and I don't know what I was going to do to get money. Like, I just was so, um, you know, when, you ju- when you're just beat to death in your brain and you're just like, well... Part of me wishes that it that that story would have ended differently. Not because I'm glad it all worked out, but just so that you <laughs> could you could say fired. at your new job whenever you're interviewing for <laughs> a position somewhere yes. else, and they ask you why you got fired, you're like, "Well, I wore the same shoes every day, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> that's like, all. Mm, that's the worst you thing you ever you did. did. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You yeah. still wear them to your interview. Yeah. So, how much of that work stress and just all the crap from your normal day job? How much did that affect your acting and your improv? Um, Not a ton because I was so happy when I was doing the other stuff. It made for a brutal schedule though. And I would like go straight from there to whatever and then be out really, really late doing whatever shows and whatever. And then um, have to be back so early. Um, So that really like started to kill But, um, the only time I remember, like, a super weird bleed was, um, I was doing this play in Austin, and I was standing on, on the side, like, had this long stretch before I was going to come back in, and I remember I had this weird, like, half dream state thing where I was, like, thinking about what, what were my lines when I went in? And the only thing I could like hear in my head was what I used to say when I answered the phones at the place, <laughs> which was, um, you know, good morning or good afternoon or whatever. Pitney Bowes Management Services. Oh God, it makes honestly, it makes me sick to say it. I need to like. Is that yeah. a trigger now? Yeah. <gasps> Done. Um, I really hope somebody from that company is. <laughs> oh my God! Me. I hope not. <laughs> we're both going to really get sued, and that's what a lot we're of gonna, them. Yeah. And that's going to be the end of it. Um, <laughs> Um, but that was really weird. That weird, like half dreaming, half awake where I went like, Oh God, stop, be here. Um, I don't know if you've ever had that like strange. It's, just, it's like a, it's like a vocational Freudian slip. Like Something, you just can't yeah. get it out. I didn't yeah. go on and say that, but there was a second where I was like, I, I don't remember what I say in this play, you know? Um, but that's the only weird time I remembered like a sort of a psychic bleed with it, but it was disturbing. So then, as you're working towards making acting more and more part of your full-time job and yeah. something that you're doing instead of answering the phones at the management service, yes. um, how did you make that transition from acting being a passion to acting being a career that you can use to support yourself? Um, so when I got to L.A., I still needed to do other stuff for a while, and I was like doing all kinds of stuff from um, temping to doing... like. Um, there was a while my friend Kendra and I did like um, clowns and princesses and stuff at, at parties, and it was like that sounds okay, but it was in LA. It was awful because it was um, the woman who ran it would schedule us for like three parties on a Saturday, and they were all like not really LA. Like you'd go to Reseda, and then you'd go to like 
Encino and then to Northridge and um, it just was brutal. And I, there was a thing in LA, I don't know like if this happens here, where people would schedule these parties for like one-year-olds. And so you go and it's like, it just feels weird. <laughs> And you're, they're not even going to remember it. No, and like they're not even going to be able to get wrangled. So you're basically just like doing whatever, like whatever game or magic trick for a bunch of like parents who are just standing there and judging you. And you're like, I want to die. <laughs> <laughs> See, what I love about this is we actually um, we have a lot of party princesses who list their services on Gig Salad. Uh-huh. It's a huge category yeah, for us. I bet. So yeah, it's interesting to hear your experiences doing it because we have. Thousands of people mm-hmm. who are doing that every day right now. Yeah. I, well, I went, like, there were probably two that I did that were, I came away going, oh, man, that was actually fun, where the kids were old enough to, like, legit play with them and do stuff, and they were interested in someone being there. The rest were torture. Torture. And I just figured that was just, like, I don't know, I kind of figured that was an L.A. thing that people schedule it for one-year-olds, but... Maybe that's everywhere. That's, yeah, we get a lot of those. We yeah. really do. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's because, like, you feel like you're doing something for your child, even though they're not really experiencing it the same yeah. way. But, like, you feel like a good parent for inviting whatever <laughs> right. princess. Which princess was it that they had you cast as? Um, oh, well, sometimes it was just generic, like, terrible blonde wig princess. Yes. Like, pink or blue dress. I wish I could say I've never worn that wig. but. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a bad wig. So, um, my, like, my dark hair would kind of, like, show through parts of it sometimes. And I remember sometimes kids would be like, you're not real. (laughs) (laughs) That was the worst ones, when the kids would, like, call you out for not being real. And you're like, oh, God, I know, dude. Just let me out of here. Just launch you into an introspective crisis. You're like, I know what is life. Who am I? Here's what also made it so terrible. Yeah, mostly it was generic princess. Sometimes they called it Cinderella. Um, but it wasn't a good costume. This woman did not run a tight ship. But I'm sure you guys have a way better system. <laughs> um, a lot of times it was a clown. Um, the coolest was the one time that I was, um, what's her name from Toy Story? Uh, the, the cowgirl? Jessie? Yeah, Jessie. Yeah. yeah. That was actually fun. Um, and I felt like, okay, I have a legit costume on. But yeah, the generic princess stuff was real dicey. And here was, I just remembered, here's what also made those so hard. So Kendra and I lived in this apartment in Studio City. And across the way, there were these guys that were our age, um, Caleb and his friends. And they would literally sit outside of their apartment and like wait for us to come out and whatever and would like cat call us and scream at us as oh we cuz we were friends with them but it was awful it was awful cuz you had to like go through the gauntlet not just the gauntlet of whatever party you're going to in northridge but you had to go through the gauntlet of like passing Caleb and his friends it was just like ah oh. <laughs> and look at her now Caleb <laughs> so what was the break? How'd you get out oh, okay. of how'd so, you get out of the princess party scene? So I was doing that and then I was temping and then I would and then every, any gig that would kinda come up of like something I could do that was like acting, I would do it. Um so whether that was, you know, go do improv at this party or do whatever. I was doing all that and I was um starting to kind of go on commercial auditions and stuff. And then I would say the thing that really helped me, like, transition over into, like, never having to do another job was um, I got, so I'm with two different um, improv groups in L.A. One's the Groundlings, and we do sketch comedy and improv. Yeah, yeah. And then um, one is called Impro Theater, and we do improvised plays, like full-length plays. Sorry, I think my phone's vibrating. I'm sorry if you can hear it. Price of popularity. <laughs> um, so before Impro Theater was Impro Theater, it was called Theater Sports, and it was short form stuff. And a couple of the guys from it had gone to New York and done this thing called Life Game, which is this long form thing where you get someone up from the audience, you interview them, and then you improvise their life. Um, and they had done it off Broadway, and there was I don't know what the connection was, but there was a girl in it 
who her mom was really good friends with um, our now friends, um, Rita Rudner, the comic, and her husband Martin, um, who is a producer. And uh, anyway, they somehow they knew us, and so Martin asked some of us to come do a show in Vegas after Rita's show, um, like a late night sketch and improv show. And so we did it for, I think the original thing was to do it for a month or something like that, but it kept getting good audiences. So we ended up doing that on and off for a year in Vegas. Um, and we would come home to LA sometimes, like if we had an audition we couldn't miss or something. It was very, very weird. It was the craziest, weirdest adventure. And um, my now husband, Dan, we were engaged then. And we, uh, we lived in hotel rooms. We had t adjoining hotel rooms and we would usually stay in one and then like if any of our family wanted to come to Vegas, we would let them stay in the other room. And uh, yeah, we got married during it, not in Vegas, but we already had like plans to get married in LA. And anyway, that, that, that gig wasn't like, oh, this is crazy money or anything like that, but it was enough that I could save up a chunk that when I got back, um, I had gone through the levels at the Groundlings and I was about to start the last level of the school, which is the Sunday Company, which is where you do a show every Sunday for um, every six months you get voted on as to whether you stay for another six months. And you do that for a year and a half and then you get voted on as to whether you're in the main company. But because I had that little, little chunk saved up, I could manage to not work for that first chunk of the Sunday Company. Because that, I mean, it's a full-time job slash grad school. So you are writing all the time. All the time. Because the show changes every week. So that was pretty cool. That was my first, like, this acting job can pay for me to live. Which was super, super exciting. And um, just a relief, you know. Um, and then I would say, like, then it sort of transitioned to... Like, if I knew if I could get a commercial, I could make that last for a while. And then, um, and then, um, you know, hope it starts to, like, add on to itself a little bit. And then you've got, like, maybe a commercial and you got a thing on a TV show. Or maybe you got, like, um, ten episodes of a TV show. or um, But, yeah, I would say that's when it kind of got, like, oh, okay, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, The Groundlings is such a cool program. Yeah. Such a cool... I mean, even just the different levels that they have and all of the stars that they've cranked out. Yeah. Kristen it's, Wiig and Will Ferrell. And I mean, yeah, the list is massive, dude. Mitch Silpa, who actually... He was I one know. of our very yeah. first interviews So here. Mitch is one of my best pals, and we actually do a two-person improv show together called Mitch and Edie Making Love. Um, <laughs> we do it, like, every couple months or something. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, we... Um, <laughs> The, the first interview that we did in this green room, we used to do them in the green room next door, but um, we did this weird, it was just audio, we didn't even have video then, but we did this weird like improv kind of game where it was like um, like charades, or name that movie uh -huh. sort of, but it was just audio, so we had to do just sound effects. Oh, for, wow. like, Remember the Titans or something, which uh, is, like, how do you do the sound uh, effects for, like, throwing a football? Yes. But it was it was so weird and it was so fun. Um, That's great. It was him and Danny Lutman, mm -hmm. um, who uh, does a lot of writing and production now. But, yeah, so fun. That's awesome. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. So then after all of that, you ended up on Blackish and Vice Principals and all of these amazing shows. Um, how did that come to be about? Um... Well, all of those, all of those uh, jobs, like, let's see, I did this, yeah, I mean, anything that I've gotten that's like a chunk of things, like, that job on Blackish um, would have kept going, but I was out of town working on Vice Principals, and they just couldn't figure out the both things, so they, um, so I was suddenly gone from the office on Blackish. <laughs> <laughs> or just took a vacation. Yeah, it took a very long vacation. <laughs> um, but that was, that was awesome and just came through an audition. Um, uh, yeah, I would say all of these came through just regular auditions, 
But I think the reason I've ever gotten any of those jobs, or any job, actually, is because of improv, and because in in particular because of Groundlings and Impro Theater, because that those are the two places that put it in me. Um, because I think there's a thing with um, with with auditioning and with sort of like I don't know that maybe the mindset in general where you almost have to get to an like an improv headspace of just going here's what here's what I do and you can like you can take it or leave it I don't know if this is right for your show or your movie or whatever but here's what I do and I'm not going to hold back and maybe it's right and maybe it isn't if that makes sense yeah for yeah. sure almost of like in a really positive way, nothing negative about this. These words sound sort of negative, but it's it's actually so positive, but almost a really fun, like, screw it mindset <laughs> of like, yeah, let's just see what happens. And I think that's a lot of times what makes good artists, no matter what your craft is, you know, with music or comedy or mm -hmm. improv, acting, yeah. all of it. You know, you just, you do what you love, and if what you love fits somebody else's need, then yeah. it's just the perfect marriage of... That's totally. how entertainment gets made. Totally. And not uh, not until, um, I mean, I don't know about you, like, with your music and stuff, but if I, unless I can get to a screw it headspace, it's not going to be awesome. Because um, if I have any fear, if I have any worry of, like, oh, what are the stakes of this? Or, like, if I do well at this, then I'll get this. Or, like, um if I have any like of that, those thoughts on it that are, <clears throat> for me, kind of anti-art, it's not going to be awesome. Right. And I think there are a million different ways where you can take your craft and fit it into a mold or fit it mm -hmm. into, you know, mm -hmm. put these brackets around it. But sure. then, it, you know, you, you lose the purity of it and the quality of it. Mm -hmm. and... Unless you're just genuinely having fun and right. not trying to do what they want you to do. Right, yeah. for sure. Yeah. One thing that a lot of the actors who um, who represent themselves with Gig Salad, um, one thing that they bring up a lot is for every audition you do, there are a million other people that want to be you, that are trying to get mm -hmm. that same spot, do mm -hmm. the same thing that you do. So sure. how do you stand out in the audition process? What's your method? Um, I, th <clears throat> I think that every, every single person, me included, their one superpower, I know that my one superpower is that I'm me. That's all I've got, is that I'm specifically me. And I have thoughts and um, it, actions, and just me being alive is just, it's different than anyone else. So not, not trying, I think, is everyone's superpower, or should be. Just to be so specifically yourself and be just exactly as weird as you are and just let it rip. Like, I think that's the... What was the exact question? Um, how, how to stand out in the audition process. Yeah, I think, I think, honestly, I think that is the only way. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think that applies to everything in life, mm -hmm. you know? The I more do too. You, the more you focus in on what you're doing and if it fits yeah. somebody else's mold and all of that, then... Mm -hmm. The less you have. Yeah. yeah but like, that's great. If, if you're doing exactly what you think is funny and exactly, more to the point, exactly what you think is true, then that's what you've got. Yeah. So speaking of funny and weird and being true and so uniquely themselves, tell me about your character from Vice Principals. She's a crazy <laughs> person. So um, funny. Yes. So crazy. <laughs> Um, have you seen all of it? I don't want to spoil it. Yes, yeah. I, okay. Okay, spoilers for those at home, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, whoa. <laughs> Dang. Um, yeah, let's see. Tell you about her. Um, well, here's, so here's the thing is I don't think she's that, <laughs> I don't think she's that weird. Um, I just think she's just like a real person. She wants like, she wants what other people want in life. She like wants a boyfriend who she loves. She wants to, like, party and have a good time. Like, <laughs> I don't think that's that different. She just, like, is maybe more... Her desperation's a little amped. <laughs> that's what I love about all the characters on that show. 
I feel like every time I watch that show, it's all of us just one step too far. I totally agree. Yeah, Miss yeah. Abbott is just Turned like up. every every single person just a little bit too much. Yeah, like if you honestly let it rip, like yeah. if you went all id and just were like and total shoot half want the main and characters need. and yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, 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 I don't want um, to record anything too sensitive or incriminating, but you were talking about being uniquely you in your characters, mm -hmm. and Miss Abbott is insane. Yes. Um, where is that coming from? <laughs> um, <clears throat> not to scare you, but like that for sure. That's. That's in me. That's not how I'm like gonna roll in real life, but obviously, there's it feels true to me. I think all of us have all of that in us, and you just like, yeah, you just gotta like <laughs> find it and go. Oh God, yep, yep, there, there, it, there is. it is, there it is. <laughs> well, yeah. That's what I think makes the character so amazing, though. You, you, she, like I said, she shoots half the main character, but <laughs> but you love her. <laughs> You still love her. She's still one of my favorite characters on the show. Because I think, like, that's awesome. Thank you. I think that she's, um, I don't know. I hope you have empathy for her. I have empathy for her. I love her. I feel so bad for her. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, she's just like, it's not going the way she wants it to. <laughs> and she's going to fix it. Yeah, she's going to try. One way or the other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, as we wrap up here, do you have any advice for people who are trying to get where you are in your career right now? Sure. Um, I think... I think you have to... Uh, I think you have to have a, uh, a certain amount of... Um, I don't know if you call it a chip or a... There's got to be a little something in me that is crazy, I think. And in a good way. And, and there's got to be... Um, I would say cultivate your confidence. Once you find that thing that is so specifically you, just know that nobody can take that. Nobody can fake it. Even when people are copying you, it's not going to be the same. They're going to look weird. It's going to feel weird because it's not true. So I would say like if once you can find that core thing and cultivate your confidence in that and like believe in it, um, then you have to just like keep going through, um, just keep not caring that you're walking through fires and like, cause there are times it's going to feel like terrible and so depressing and, but you just have to know like this, actually this is how it's supposed to be going and it's going to work out. Um, and then I think it, it does. Um, if, I think when you really, when you actually have talent, just keep doing it. Yeah, just keep on doing it. That I mean, I hope that's not too vague. No, I think that's perfect. Yeah, I think that's exactly what people need. Because mm -hmm. then cool stuff happens. Like when you let it, you just have to like just keep doing it and open like open up psychically. Perfect. Well, the one and only Edie Patterson. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us. Thank you guys. <laughs>